Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor and the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for joining us on your favorite podcast app. If you're Android, no more Google Podcasts. It's actually probably a good thing. Check us out on Spotify or the Five Reasons YouTube channel. If you're iPhone, you always can use Apple Podcasts. Also, check out Off the Floor. That's our new Discord server, $2.99 per month. we got all kinds of channels on there. You can follow the draft stuff with us. we got promo deals, music culture, but mostly we got heat conversation with us and with your friends and people who may not be your friends. Check it out. Off the Floor, $2.99 per month. Link is right here in the description on the YouTube channel and the podcast feed. So make sure you're in there prior to the play-in. Also, check out the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. If you're outside the state of Florida, you can still play prize picks. Use the code 5FIVE. Get that initial deposit matched up to $100. Still legal in 31 states. Florida, eventually, we'll see when it comes back. But as you know, you can play two, three, four, five, six players together. And again, if you use the code 5 at prize picks, you get that initial deposit matched up to $100. No catches, no rollovers, no nothing. It's free money until you play it. Check it out, prizepicks.com. And now, today's episode. Down to this game. Yay. Uh, five on the floor, ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing, you can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck and Sam, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor playing, got an all band. Y'all seen the block, stop in one hand. And Pat, we trust, it's power, have the guts. We here to bring the heat, y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, welcome back to Five on the Floor. Here's today's floor plan. I'm Ethan Skolnick. You can follow me at Ethan J. Skolnick and at Five Reasons Sports. I've got Greg Sylvander. You can follow me at Greg Sylvander. And back from his trip. Are you back from your trip? I'll get to that in a second. Back from No, you're not. Back from his trip. We're not back from his trip to Atlanta covering for us here. Five reason sports is our usual playback host. You'll see him back on there shortly. Our guy eternal bass. So check out his work on playback on there on every game. And speaking of games, the Miami heat have just two left in the regular season. They're against a Toronto team that is openly tanking, trying to keep their lottery pick because they will be keeping it. If they are in a bottom six position in the league, Otherwise, they have to give it away, and so they have no reason to win these two games. Um, But we know that that doesn't necessarily matter against the Miami Heat, particularly the way that they're playing lately. And Sean Rochester had a stat uh, earlier today that just hits on it. This year, when the Heat are under 105 offensive rating, they're 1-15. in Okay. So that basically means that in most of those games, the defense probably did well enough to win, but the offense has been atrocious. And I mean, what, I mean, if you can't get 105 offensive rating in the modern NBA, I mean that you're going back to like late nineties type stuff. And that's where they're at. I mean, we've talked all season about trying to get this thing to work in different fits and guys in and out of the lineup. And how is it going to work when Tyler came back? But really they are where they are after 80 games. They're a bad offensive team. And that is what's held them back the entire year. It's why they're, and this is an incredible statistic, 0-10 against the top five teams in the West. And I'll tell you, because I went through some of those games, most of them were not competitive either. And Barry Jackson from the Miami Herald has been saying this. They're getting walloped by good teams this year. It's not like they're losing all these games at the end, although they haven't been good in the clutch. And it's almost like, who have they beat? I keep saying this. I said this on the podcast with Alex the other night. Like, how did they get these 44 wins? Cause I can't remember a lot of them. Like they've lost to Washington. They've lost to Memphis, the dregs of the league. And then they've lost all the good teams. It's kind of like the lower middle of the league that they've cleaned up against a little bit. So I guess they're the best of the play in teams, maybe, or one of the better ones, but this is not where we expected them to be going into the playoffs. So what we're going to talk about today is best and worst case scenarios. And we're going to open this up. Okay, Greg, we're going to open this up. So this could be anything. Your best case scenario could be they get beaten in the play-in and they have to blow up the whole team. It could be anything. Give me your best case, best case scenario for the Miami Heat the rest of the season. Best case scenario is undoubtedly getting the seventh seed, facing a flawed, maybe injured Milwaukee team, and that's your path to a run in the Eastern Conference. That's your best case scenario. I do not see anything else that you could pitch to me that would be a better 
position for them. Although technically there are scenarios that could land them as high as five still on the board. If certain things were to happen, like we're talking crazy scenarios would have to all collide for it to actually manifest, but it's not going to happen. They're going to likely be in that seven, eight playing matchup, getting the seven seed, playing a team like Milwaukee that may have Giannis banged up or limited or coming back from that injury. Who knows how that's going to pl play out. That's their best spot for me. Hands down. Now, when you talk about all the crazy scenarios, crazy scenarios do happen. Um, the Heat still talk about this one. Spolstra talks about this one. I was talking to a front office person this week who mentioned this one. If you go back to that 2003-2004 season, which, of course, was Dwayne's rookie year, they started 0-7, there were like five scenarios on the last day of the season. And somehow the Heat at 42-40, and 40, think of that, ended up with the four seed and a home series uh, against, well, I guess it was New Orleans, and ended up obviously winning that series, and Dwayne with the famous shot, runner shot and all the rest of that at the end of it. So crazy things do happen, and sometimes things happen that you don't want to happen. I remember Yakuba Diawara hitting a shot that the Heat really didn't want him to hit, and that ended up uh, creating a matchup in the first round that Miami didn't necessarily win. This was during the period of time where Dwayne was basically on his own. So lots of crazy things can happen, but the most likely scenario at this stage uh, is that they're the 7 or the 8, and either way, they're going to have to win that game to avoid either being knocked out completely or facing Boston in the first round. And like uh, to me, those are equally bad scenarios because um, I don't know that anybody wants to see the, the Heat against Boston now. Like I said, if you got them in the Eastern Conference Finals when you had some rhythm, maybe that'd be a different story, but not the way they're playing. All right, so Eternal, I'll go to you here. What is the best case scenario for this team and for this franchise? I'll load this question. All right, I, I would say the best case scenario is one, getting a very healthy Duncan Robinson back. That is the best case scenario for them, regardless of seeding. If they want to go on a playoff run or a play-in run that turns into a playoff run, they need Duncan. I don't care how well Tyler is playing. I don't care if you get playoff Jimmy back. Everybody else is firing. You need Duncan just because of uh, his – you know, ignitability, as Bo likes to say, but also the gravity that he draws from other teams. Second, it's the sixth seed. I know Greg talked about the impossibility of them, you know, getting the fifth seed, but if they get the sixth seed, you possibly get either the Cavs, the Knicks, or whoever else in the first round. You get out of the play-in, so you get out of a do-or-die situation. Um, you get a chance to kind of prepare to rest, get your mind together for who your first round matchup is and you go to war you take that series if you win it you can you know kind of get yourself together galvanize the troops now you prepare for the second round and then you maybe see milwaukee right and so now you're going with steam uh towards the eastern conference finals and possibly the finals that's the best case scenario uh for the franchise um i think that's also the best case scenario i don't think I know many of our listeners and audience, those that watch, don't watch, or whatever, um, on Twitter and off of Twitter, think that you know Miami just crashing out is probably the best for the franchise. I'm here to tell you that's not. That's not it. That makes for a very, mm -hmm. very uncomfortable summer. And for those of you that want a certain thing done, I'm not going to mention that certain thing that you want done. You do not want the possibility. <laughs> of them bringing back the same team next year because, oh, we didn't mm -hmm. see. It. That's not the scenario that you want for the franchise. So you want to see them go into the playoffs, and if they crash and burn, let them crash and burn with everything that they have available. I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, that is what's the shadow over all of this, right, yeah. is that there are there's a contingent of Heat fans, and again, um, we respect those who are most in tune, and those who are most in tune, probably a lot of the people who listen to this podcast, and then there's sort of a smaller segment that is kind of the most influential, say, 30 to 40 Heat Twitter accounts. Um, a lot of those were in that tournament that was put together by our friend over Miami, UK, um, I think I only made, what did I make? The quarters of that. Um, I, Greg, did you get further than me on that? I think you actually did. Um, final four, baby. I did final four. I didn't make the final four. I was eliminated in the lead eight, but I did better than John Calipari typically does in the tournament. So I'll take it. But uh, there is a, uh, again, a, a smaller subset 
Um, and to me, I look at it this way. There's those who just follow the team casually. Okay. If they're good, they'll follow them. If they don't, they won't. Then there's those who show up at the arena regularly. Um, that's sort of the second subset. You know, some of that comes down to economics and all the rest of that. But those that we see at the arena, a lot of those happen to be five on the floor listeners. We appreciate you. Then there's those who listen to the show religiously. That's kind of the next subset. And then there's the smaller subset as we go down the pier or up the pyramid here, I guess, to the heat Twitter influencers. And they're the loudest, but they are a small minority. And sometimes we forget that. OK, but I can tell you that the organization pays attention to them, even if sometimes they laugh about it. I don't, I don't mean laugh in like a mean-spirited way, but they're kind of like, okay, you know, everybody's got agendas on there. It's what we call playback no agendas. Everybody's got a perf a player that they like, don't like. There are BAM stands, there are hero stands, there are Jimmy stands, there are, and then there are those who are the opposite end of that spectrum on each of them. Um, and that contingent, I can tell you, is probably the only contingent that wants them to crash and burn. And I'm telling you, and it's a subset of that contingent. It's not all of them because they believe that that is the only way to get the front office to act. And I'm just going to tell you that that's stupid. I'm just going to tell you that's stupid because you're not giving these people enough credit, okay, for the internal evaluations that they do. And I can tell you that in my time getting to know people in the front office and the benefit of covering the heat is it's the same damn people. And I say that with the most possible respect. It was, it's a good thing because they've been a stable organization. It's the same people that have been there for the most part, excuse me, for the past quarter century. And so th those people, like everyone acts like they're asleep or they don't understand this, they're not paying attention. And that's just not true. Okay. They see a lot of the things that people on Twitter, even in that subset, see. But they can't be as reactionary to every little thing that happens. And they also can't just act because people want them to act. Because first thing, sometimes it's not either economically prudent, it's not prudent for the future of the franchise, or they just don't have a willing partner on the other side, whether it's the player that they want to acquire, or maybe they're dealing with an incompetent general manager with a grudge like Joe Cronin. So I just want to be clear on this. Like, this is not a scenario, and we'll get to your worst case scenarios in a second. It's not a situation where, like, the Heat have to, it has to be thrown in their face that this team is not good enough to contend for a championship. Okay. I think we've seen it this year. <laughs> I think we've seen it. I think they've seen it. And I think we've gotten to the point where what Eric Spolcher said before the year, which we believe were one of those teams. Even if you made the finals last year, I don't think you can make the argument that you're one of those teams. When you faced those teams in the Western Conference and you've lost all 10 games to the top five, and you, by the way, have also lost all your games to the top team in the East. So, I, what is it, 0-3 against Boston? So you're talking about 0-13 against Boston and the top five teams of the East? There's nobody who can make a rational argument, injuries or no injuries, that you are one of those teams when that's the case. We are holding to what happened last year and saying, well, maybe they can morph into that, but that would require their best player to play like he played last year. And I just don't think for a lot of reasons he's capable of that right now. So anyway, that's where I'm at. And then after the break, we'll get to your worst case scenarios. Hey, it's Ethan Skolnick for the Five Reasons Sports Network. We've got a great new sponsor that fits with us perfectly. It's called jerseys305.com. That's jerseys305.com. This is your home for dead stock and vintage jerseys from the Heat, Panthers, Dolphins, Marlins, and the other local teams. Their mission was born from a passion for wearing jerseys of the old styles and the past players. Jerseys 305 aims to make every fan stand out from the crowd with unique pieces that you don't commonly see anymore. Maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, but not today. And Jerseys 305 was created by the fans, for the fans. They're diehards just like you. In fact, they're probably listening to this episode right now so check them out jerseys 305 their partnership with five reason sports celebrating with a 10 percent discount on the next purchase using the code five at checkout unlock your exclusive savings on the entire vintage collection all right so as we come back here let's get to it what is the worst case scenario eternal for the rest of this season uh, they lose the next four games. Or three. <laughs> I I actually think no, no, it, it, it can't be three, right? It can, can it be three? Because if they, because they would, they would play. They can't be worse than eight. Is that right? They can't no, be worse than eight. Saying. So if they, if they're, if they are the eight seed. Oh, no, no, no. 
So it is for it. it is for they it. still would get another game. Yes, they, they mm-hmm. would get another game uh, regardless. It's just that they obviously wouldn't uh, be able to slip into that seven seed. Yeah. So I, to me, the worst case scenario would be they lose the next four games. So that means the two Toronto games to a depleted Toronto roster, which the only big that they have available is Kelly O. Right. So they lose those two games back to back. They lose the seven and the eight seed matchup. Then they lose um, against whoever wins nine and ten. So then they're out. And then we have a very uncomfortable summer of what the Heat are going to do in the draft and free agency, uh, who's getting traded, why they should get traded. And it just becomes a Heat civil war on multiple social media platforms, including and not including uh, five off the floor. You can sign up for two ninety nine off the Apple. Um, you really want? I, we appreciate the promotion, Eternal. You really want to welcome the war there, but yes, uh-huh. that, that's uh, yeah. That that would that would be a good place to do it. Um, you're going to have to moderate that, so I don't envy you on that. I mean, losing the next four. Look, if they lose the next two to Toronto, then I mean, I mean, come on. Like, I mean, you yeah. you lose to a team that's trying to lose. See. There's a part of me that actually, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but the way they're playing right now, it's almost as bad to have to play this team in a seven game series against Boston right now. It's almost as bad. I think it's going to expose um, a ton of flaws. The only reason why I'll say that it obviously is not a worse scenario is that, you know, anybody can get injured at any moment and anything can change a series immediately. So like you have to just keep that into an account. You get a Tatum sprained ankle or something like that. It changes the complexion of the entire series. So somebody's going to clip that. I'm telling you now, somebody's going to clip that. That's okay. But I still, uh, I would say that missing the playoffs after making the finals would be one of the worst case scenarios. So Eternal's right there, but it's close. That Celtic series is not going to be fun the way that they're playing right now with right. this team. Right. Um, and also if Duncan Robinson is not fully healthy. Well, that, that's one of the things. Well, we've talked about Boston throughout this year. Um, and I've said this, and, and so I'm sure people will find old clips of me saying this or old tweets. It, it's clear that the Heat, it hasn't appeared itself this season, but in the playoffs that this team has a bit of a mental edge over that team. I mean, it's just now... They've added Drew, they've added Chris Dops, and obviously Porzingis has added this other element to them. And look, the Heat were not happy when Drew went to Boston. They wanted Drew. They certainly didn't want Joe Cronin to send Drew there. So you're talking about, obviously, you know, a much better team than they saw last year. Like, they, they, they're they deeper uh, than they were. I mean, I thought they'd miss Marcus Smart. They don't. Um, and the bench, there's some of the pieces on there that have been better than they were last season. And again, Porzingis allowed everybody to kind of fall into place and he's allowed to create even more of this spread offense for them. But there were times this year that we felt Miami could give them a run. And I felt that way. And we were like, Oh, Hawkes is the next guy who's going to do this. But now you see Jaime's hit the wall. Right. And I, I it, it really, this entire conversation. Okay. Comes back to Jimmy because it's Jimmy that Boston was afraid of. You know, see in Boston, right? Like we all this sort of stuff. And and you know, it was that was the thing. That's the edge that the Heat have had. Like, regardless of talent, maybe Tatum is more talented, maybe Brown is equally talented, but Jimmy had that mental edge on them. And right now, you just don't get you're not getting that Jimmy in, in these in the games that matter. You haven't got it against Boston this year, you didn't get it against Dallas. And we've talked about his numbers in those games. And I just, unless there's, unless he can ramp up in some way that just does not seem apparent right now, not over a seven game series, then I don't know how you could feel good about that. And so that's why it was kind of like, okay, if you can avoid Boston until then, and maybe Milwaukee, we know Milwaukee's flawed defensively, all the other issues that they're going through. Now Giannis is hurt again. Okay, so maybe you get Milwaukee, and you don't see Boston until the Eastern Conference Finals. By then, maybe Jimmy. Is feeling his legs again. You know, you get more off days in the playoffs. You don't play the back to backs. Maybe they even finish the series early and he can pace himself and concentrate. Then maybe you could get him where he could lift off against Boston again. But in the first round, honestly, if they saw them in the first round right now, I agree with you, Greg. They get swept. I, I just think they get swept. I don't. Go ahead, Eternal. I was just going to say, I have a very interesting stat for you guys. And then I get to my point. Uh, this is from Simon Smith. 
or Simon Spielberg on Sperling. Sorry, I always get Simon's name wrong on Twitter. But Simon yeah. has uh, the Heat are four and nine when Jimmy Butler has a usage rate under twenty percent. When it is above thirty, they are seven and one. And that one game, I believe, is that Pacers game when Ty- Tyrese Halliburton was out. Uh, which was just like a fluke game. But other than right. that, the Heat has been really good with Jimmy having a higher usage rate. The analogy I want to use is that yeah. it feels like the Miami Heat organization in the city of Miami has put up the playoff Jimmy signal, like the bat signal, and they have been waiting mm-hmm. like a city on fire, waiting for him to show up. And they've gotten right. some flashes. But they haven't gotten him to come through and really save the day. They are waiting desperately for these last okay. four games for him or last three games for him to show up. And hopefully and and, and and that's the conversation that will be had when this is over. Is was that fair? And I and 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 to Jimmy. Okay. And in other words, would should he be in a position at age 34? where the Jimmy signal has to go up and he has to answer or they don't have a chance. And that's going to be one of the questions that's talked about with his build. And we'll get into the circumstances of it and all the rest of it. I'm just dealing in the reality of what we've seen. And when I put up today, like his numbers this year, he's actually averaging more shots on a higher shooting percentage and a higher effective field goal percentage than he did his first year in Miami. He was celebrated his first year in Miami and he's been criticized this year. So what is the difference? It's eye test. It really is. It's like, it's just what we're seeing. It doesn't look the same and it doesn't look the same in the big games. And also the other metrics are down. His assists are down. His steals are down. We talk about kind of the energy being dictated by the steals and that kind of stuff. Defensively, he's not quite where he was. So he's not generating offense for all those. And and I just think it comes down to Greg and I'm gonna let you, you close this thing. Uh, Did you come up with your worst case scenario? Did you sort of, you you piggybacked on a turtles a little bit? No, no, I, my worst case scenario is, is ultimately the same as Eternals, but mm-hmm. not far behind is a damn series against Boston 1 8. Right. I'm telling you, it's right. going to be ugly. Right. Hey, listen, yeah. let me tell you I'm, real quick I'm before, with you. Before he goes, I he is, he is take precedence over mine. If the Miami Heat lose to Boston in the first round, whether they get swept or period, if they lose to Boston in the first round, it is the absolute worst, worst case scenario of this season. It's the worst. It makes for the absolute worst experience as a Heat fan, as a Heat media member, ever. Boston, because it's Boston, because it's Boston, because and there'll be and, and there'll be celebration in the media and all the rest of that stuff. And and I get it. Bill Simmons can have his day and and everything else. And so I I'm with you on that. I I think I don't think it's losing to Boston. I think it's the way that they would lose to Boston. I think that's. I think losing to Boston this year is no shame, even though I still don't think they're going to win the championship. I think a team in the West is most likely Denver again, but it, I just, I don't think it'll be particularly close. And I, I, that's, that's the thing. And again, I know there's a segment of heat fans that's going to say, well, good, good, because we have to see how far away we are. Um, I don't think heat fans should want to experience that regardless. Uh, Greg, I'll let you have the last word here. We thank our sponsors, 305jerseys.com and our friends over at prize picks use the code five. Final thoughts. Do you have any guts, Greg? Give me, give me a guts. We don't really do the guts check imaging anymore. Go ahead. No, I guess I'll just say this. You never know when a build is about to all of a sudden end. And I'm not alluding to anything, but you never know what the hell is going to happen next. So try to enjoy a little bit of these last few games uh, mm-hmm. because you never know when all of a sudden the team completely changes. We've seen it happen before. Entire rosters have flipped or everyone but the top two guys have flipped, things like that. So um, if we're going to look forward to anything in these last few, let's uh, try to at least appreciate the guys that are here. That's about as positive as I can get. Uh, I'm trying to dig deep, you know, with the guts, but it's, it's been, it's been a rough stretch to find guts at this moment. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I, and I want to uh, just piggyback off that a little bit. You could be watching Hassan Whiteside and that's what you had before Jimmy. So I, I do think whenever this ends, and I'm not saying that the Jimmy era is over. It may have to evolve, okay? But whenever this ends, uh, I think we should appreciate what he brought here. And I think all this criticism that's coming in now needs to be in that context. 
the bat, the Jimmy signal has gone up because Jimmy's answered the Jimmy signal in three of the last four postseasons. Yeah. And the criticism now is when you've put it up in the regular season is kind of like a test. Like, does he still have it for the playoffs? He hasn't answered. And I think that's where the issue is right now, but there still needs to be an appreciation of the fact that a guy who was the 30th pick in the draft, who didn't start as a rookie, who was not projected to be a superstar, gave you that feeling that you could win any game against anybody, against Giannis, against Tatum, against all of them. He's just not giving you that feeling this year. And to me, against LeBron. And to me, that's their chance. We'll see. But it seems pretty slim at the moment. Thanks to Greg. Thanks to Eternal. As Eternal said, sign up for Off the Floor. Uh, We'll be back with coverage. Uh, Alex is going solo to the game on Friday. Also, uh, he wanted me to pass this on. Uh, Brady Hawk, one of our co-hosts here, appreciates all the messages that have been sent his way over the past couple of days uh, from inside the Heat organization and from the Heat uh, Twitter and Heat fans and Five on the Floor fans as well. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you for listening to The Five on the Floor on the Five Reason Sports Network. After all, someone needs to listen to my dad.